everybody. Welcome back to the Ball and Breakfast podcast uh, with Wayne and Patrick. Uh, Going to go over an NBA draft uh, first round mock. Uh, we are looking forward to Thursday night's draft. Uh, we've already done a simulated uh, lottery mock draft. You can find that on YouTube if you're with us on video. Um, but for the purposes of tonight, uh, we did this similarly in our NFL draft mocks uh, in, in months past. But basically, Wayne and I will decide who goes first and second. And then we're going to alternate picks. So we'll just go back and forth for each one of the teams. We'll be wearing our GM caps for those teams. So, you know, we're not just going to like go down the big board and, you know, pick the, you know, all the players in order from one to 30. But in the same sense, like we're going to think about what these teams need. We may have a mock draft, you know, mock trade here or there. Um, you know, things may get a little crazy, but we're going to try to do our best to uh, think about what we would have to do as the team with all the pressure, you know, for that pick. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Wayne. Uh, we'll, we'll consider our draft order here and uh, you know give any sort of uh, opening lines. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, so I guess I got the first pick here. Uh, you know, we've talked about this guy a bunch uh, with the Spurs. I think this is the easiest pick in the draft, right? Like you got to pick Victor Wembanyama, uh, number one overall. Uh, you know, the unicorn. The the make a player, the future goat, like all the accolades and everything. Um, you know, I, I think JJ Reddick actually just did a podcast with him, and I mean his mentality, I think, is setting him up uh, up for success. Uh, so hey, we'll see what happens. But I don't know if there's any anything else we can add on here. But you gotta pick Victor here and uh, just you know go up go up to the the podium there, put the ballot in there, saying hey Victor. Uh, come join the Spurs. I think that's pretty simple here. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't think you're gonna get a lot of pushback um, for me on that pick. I think overall, that's the uh, the no brainer of the draft. Whether or not he lives up to all the hype that everyone's putting on him, I think if you're a GM in that slot, like there's no other choice you can really make. So um, for sure, I, I'd agree with that pick. Um, it goes to me. Uh, I'm the Charlotte Hornets GM. Um, I'm looking at a team right now that has, you know, LaMelo Ball, uh, Mark Williams at center. Uh, outside of that, uh, you know, PJ Washington, Kelly Oubre may leave in free agency. Gordon Hayward's got a hefty contract. So I'm trying to, you know, maybe move that in some sort of trade. Um, now there have been rumors swirling around uh, Buzz City that, you know, Zion Williamson may be available and we may be able to swing that trade. But to be honest with you, uh, as the GM of the Charlotte Hornets, I don't want Zion Williamson. Um, you know, honestly, I don't want his injuries. I don't want his baggage. Um, you know, let him kind of see if he can hit his ceiling with New Orleans or elsewhere. But for me, I'm not trading the number two pick. And uh, it came down to two players for for me, for the most part. Uh, you could even throw in a pair of twins that I was looking at as well. But um, I'm going to take Brandon Miller uh, with the you know second pick here. I just think with LaMelo, you know, I've got my my true, you know, um, offensive pilot. I've got the guy that I'm most confident in as a franchise player for our team. You know, I love what Scoot Henderson could do. I just don't want him getting in the way of the development of LaMelo Ball in that sense. So, you know, what, what else do I need? I mean, our team needs really everything. We need a guy who's versatile, um, can really do it all. And I think Brandon Miller with his, you know, shot creation, his handles, his ability to play defense both on and off the ball, you know, 6'8" you know, still young. It's just for me, um, I think both guys are in the same, you know, tier as far as talent goes. So, you know, I guess it just comes down to fit at the end of the day. And, and Brandon Miller's my guy. Yeah. I've been, I've been just seeing, you know, I thought you were a little crazy there. You know, I think on the, the last draft that, that you did and everything, but I honestly, yeah, it does make sense. I think you made some good arguments there about, you know, this is a wing lead league and everything. And, you know, uh, when you have Lamel Ball uh, being kind of like, I don't know, almost like maybe like your shortest player on the court, uh, I think that's good. I think that's great defense, all that length, right? Uh, being able to guard, again, this is positionless basketball. Why not uh, have Lamel Ball as your like primary ball handler there? You know, you don't have to have Scoot there. You can have somebody that can uh, play off ball as well as, you know, he definitely has showcased his ability to play make as well. So I think. Brandon Miller, at least for what they're and their team wants and needs, I think that totally makes sense there. With respect to Skew Henderson, uh, you know, I, I think with him, 
it's it becomes less of a it, it, it just becomes i think less of a burden i don't want to maybe not, not not to say he's necessarily a burden but when you have a 6-2 guard like that even it, no matter how explosive he is uh you know it kind of takes away that advantage that what the lamella ball does have you know being a big point guard and being able to surround him you know with uh some decent wings and such so overall i have come to like this pick more of for the hornets and for hornets fans so um yeah, I, I I think that's the way to go, and it seems like that's where Charlotte, at least the rumor mill, has been uh, pushing for that. So, yeah, cool. Um, well, I guess then with this next pick, you know, Scoot's on the board for Portland, and you know, I think last uh, the last draft that I had, I I, know, I had that trade with Siakam. Well, I'm gonna shake it up a little bit, you know. Uh, <laughs> Dame Willard still, I think he wants to stay, right? So I'm going to play that angle. Um, but you mentioned Zion, right? I'm like, hey, you know, I think there's been a lot more rumors now coming of late of uh, the Pelicans liking Scoot and what he brings to the table. You know, I don't know if Jose Alvarado is like your uh, your your ch- a championship point guard, but maybe Scoot is, so... Uh, I say that in this mock draft that the Portland Trailblazers will trade the third pick, Scoot Henderson, for Zion. Uh, And Scoot, welcome to the Pelicans. And then now you're on the clock with the Rockets. Who do you got? So for the Rockets, um, you know, I think, again, it's coming down to offensive fit um team fit with this you know with this team overall i feel like they've got their you know backcourt pretty much figured out at this point as far as uh you know kevin porter jr and jalen green go i love shen goon jamari smith so i'm looking for a true three a guy who can shoot um which is why i'm gonna go with cam whitmore uh i just overall feel like his offensive prowess is you know just a tick above the thompson brothers um who definitely came into consideration here um, you know, overall he's got, you know, just great athletic ability, probably maybe on par with the Thompsons in general, but he's just got, you know, the interior scoring can shoot, um, from the outside a bit and, you know, just his ability to kind of switch on the small forward power forward positions. I feel like, you know, would give them a little bit of versatility. Um, they said at times he can be a little hoggy with the ball. Um, again, I feel, I feel like I kind of covered this in our last, uh, episode uh, when we did the lock mod, you know, the mock, uh, lottery and stuff. But I, I, I overall think like if he's in an offense where you've got two ball dominant guards, um, you know, the, the front court, I just think, yeah, just in general, uh, you know, his ability to kind of fit into that offense, they've got a good backcourt. who's going to you know, basically command a lot of the possessions. Uh, the front court also has the ability to score and, and kind of create. So in a lot of ways, Cam Whitmore is just going to be relied upon to kind of catch and shoot. I'm going to allow him to get his feet wet in the NBA. And I think he's got a lot of upside too beyond that. But I think just to start, this is a good place for him to land at number four. Yeah, no, you, you've definitely mentioned that before. And it is kind of hard to, I guess, go against that. You know, uh, there's definitely been this whole, I think, idea of is Porter like, you know, kind of that guard or does he want to play off the ball a little bit more? So, you know, this really, I think, will showcase kind of which, which direction they want to go. Uh, and I know there's been a lot of rumors now, right, uh, with James Harden maybe uh, rejoining the, the Rockets, you know, providing a little bit, little bit of that veteran leadership. So he can be kind of that point guard, right, uh, so that Jalen Green and Porter Jr. can play uh, off the ball there. And then uh, Whitmore, you know, I think he can definitely be uh, that, you know, playing off the ball, right, and being att- att- attacking the basket, uh, so I, I think that's where he could fit in yeah, again, if they do get James Harden. Right. So um, I, I don't, I don't think there's any knock necessarily on Whitmore joining here, but um, you know, I, I might have my heart set on some other people, but at the same time, you know, with the, I guess now moving on to the fifth pick here with the Detroit Pistons, man, you know uh, it's, I don't think you can go Amon Thompson here. Actually, not not now that your uh, your your drafting has kind of like uh, you know pushed things along a little bit, but I don't think he can go Amon here. I feel like with them, their roster, right? Um, that's just a little bit too much there in terms of dribblers. So uh, I think though that 
Uh, they do need that kind of wing a little bit. So I'm going to go uh, with Amon's brother, Oster, here. Uh, I think it just makes some, makes sense uh, having, you know, that athletic, like all the Thompson brothers are super athletic. So having Oster there uh, kind of at the two, three tweener, like uh, with Ivy and then, you know, Cade Cunningham, I feel like that's just a good uh, kind of backcourt, frontcourt, one through three there. So I'm going to go ahead, pick uh, Oster here. Uh, I think I think you kind of had something similar like this. So uh, definitely kind of playing into your hands here. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love the pick. I mean, I feel like, you know, they want some defense, um, some toughness there, a guy who could be athletic. So we could also, you know, shoot as well. I think they need an extra shooter. But in the same sense, that can come with, you know, just a little bit of time. You know, Oster is more of uh, the off the ball type player as it is. So, you know, as he grows, I think he'll be able to kind of, you know, maybe develop that shot. And if not, you know, just ha- cause havoc on the defensive end and, you know, create some transition plays for guys like Kate and Jaden Ivy and stuff. Um, really quickly to go back to Houston, I, I just, I have to make a comment about the James Harden potential trade and everything like that. I just think it's absolute garbage. I don't know why Houston thinks they have to go there at this time in their, you know, in their franchise. And like, I know this isn't about James Harden and everything like that, but just all the rumors I'm hearing, all the, analysis about it on tv it just kind of makes me sick like why a team who you know is really crafting like a master plan here is deciding just like throw caution in the wind and kind of you know scrap it for you know this um i don't even know it's like a mini retirement tour for for james harden just a a guy who's kind of continually tried to find the exits wherever he's gone so um in any case that's my my plea for houston to just please use your heads and and don't fall back into these old traps. And uh, in any case, good pick for Detroit at number five. And, uh, you know, looking to keep this uh, this uh, mock going forward here. Yeah, but you always got to take your swings at James Harden, even in a, in a mock draft. But, <laughs> hey, it's, I'm all for it. So. <laughs> Since our podcast, we can do what we want. But, yeah, no, I mean – don't, don't don't mess up the mock draft with with James Harden going anywhere near Houston. You know, keep him at a playoff contender, a team that's trying to make a super team, and like let him stroke his ego in that you know sense. But please don't don't go ro- like ruin a good thing that's it's just starting. Um, at number yeah. six, I got the Orlando Magic. Um, amen. He fell to us at number six. Um, there have been rumors that Orlando is trying to get up. Uh, higher into the draft to go get Scoot Henderson. They're really about Scoot Henderson. I think they need, you know, a point guard who's really going to, tr- you know, take the reins, be, you know, the franchise leader. You know, the thing that's great about Amen, he stands, you know, six seven. He's kind of like a Lamelo Ball type, just in in stature. Which for them, you know, it's going to cause all sorts of havoc. I mean, I feel like you got him, you got Franz, you know, Wagner, you got Paolo. Um, can really bring a lot of great scoring guards off the bench or, you know, pair them up, you know, whether it's Suggs, Anthony, uh, Fultz, depending on who's there, you know, when this season kicks off, I just think this roster, Wendell Carter, you know, junior as well. It's just, it's just a really uh, nice roster for any one of these rookies to walk into, especially a guy like Amin Thompson, who's, you know, just going to show his athletic, you know, ability. He can, you know, handle the rock, obviously play good defense, if there's any knock on him, it's just maybe like his ability to score, hit three pointers at this point in his career. But, you know, with everything I'm hearing, you know, this guy, I think has the potential to be the best player in this draft. Um, if he goes to the right situation, like Orlando, um, not only is that team going to be one of the most dangerous teams in the East in the next couple of years, but, you know, for him, it's just like the perfect way to, to get your feet wet in the NBA. Yeah, I mean, that team is just loaded with a bunch of talent, uh, a bunch of, you know, athleticism. And having either of the, the Thompson twins, I think it totally makes sense. It's totally uh, on brand for that Orlando Magic team, right? They've always been trying to get, you know, people that have some explosiveness and adding either one of the Thompson brothers. I mean, I think Oscar might make more sense, but at the same time with, you know, how this draft kind of rolled out, if Amon's there, I, I don't know if, if I'm the if I'm the Orlando Magic, why not take him? Like you can always trade, right? If you know uh, Suggs is complaining or or Cole Anthony's pl- uh, complaining and, and things just aren't working out there. But honestly, yeah, like you have all those rotational pieces, you know, all those I guess point guards, combo guards. Like there there could be enough room, I think, for 
for all those players in that team. And man, that athleticism, again, that's just something I think that that Orlando Magic team, that's that's something to love, I think, overall for them. They need shooting, but at the same time, I don't think there's too much shooting in, uh, at this uh, at this early in the draft, so might as well take a, a player like Amon Thompson here. Yeah, yeah, I think this is one of those situations where you, you just take the best you know available position you know player off the board, and in a lot of ways, I feel like there's going to be you know a steeper cliff. I feel like after the top six, in my opinion, just kind of looking at it, there seems to be somewhat of a cliff in talent once you move past that point. Um, as far as shooting goes. You know, and we'll talk about it when we get to their second pick at number 11. But, you know, there are some really, you know, interesting options in the middle of the first round uh, in this year's draft where, you know, maybe you can wait on that, you know, elite sharpshooter and just, you know, see what's available to you um, as the draft board continues to flow here. For sure, for sure. Yeah, we'll definitely uh, see that on the 11th pick there. But, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> on, at the 7th pick here with the Pacers, you know, there's a couple of players here that, you know, I think could fit in pretty well uh, with their their current roster. You know, you kind of look at the team right now. Uh, could definitely use that like power forward uh, type of player. Um, you know, if you look at the current roster here. So I'm gonna go with, uh, and I know this. I think you picked like Taylor Hendricks, and I really like Taylor Hendricks. But um, you know, I think they kind of want a little bit of a mean streak. So I think they'll get uh, Juris Walker here. I think him. You know, paired up with the rest of their team with. You know, Hal Burden, Buddy Heal, Miles Turner, etc. Uh, I think he fits in really well. Uh, kind of has that Draymond type of aspect a little bit, like small uh, in terms of, I guess, a power forward like at six seven a little bit, uh, but you know, pretty thick, but pretty athletic, and has long arms, and you know, can shoot the the three a little bit too. So I feel like he fits right in uh, to kind of that Pacers uh, basketball uh, uh, prototype, right? So. Uh, Jarris Walker from Houston, uh, you know, welcome, I guess, to the, <laughs> to the Pacers here. So I'm going to pick him right now. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not opposed to this at all. I think, you know, he's got a lot of grit to him. Um, you know, obviously people have been, you know, comparing him to Draymond, which I think any team would love to have, uh, you know, he's got the ability to make shots. I think Jairus Walker will be a good NBA player. I think he'll just, whether or not he hits another, you know, gear or is like an upper end prospect, I think at the the very fundamental level, he's got a really solid floor. And I think any team that's, you know, trying to compete um, for playoff spots, whatever it is, like a guy like Jairus Walker on your team is probably, you know, somebody could bring a lot of hard character leadership to the team and obviously like fill holes where they're needed. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, yeah, and I guess with the next pick now, you know, with that Bradley Beal trade now happening with uh, <laughs> the Wizards here, uh, who do you got the Wizards taking? Yeah, um, so this has changed a little bit for me. I feel like from our um, our mock lottery uh, about a week ago now, kind of looking at what they needed and where they should probably go with this pick, um, for me, I think this changes the game a lot, the Beal trade, because, you know, with Beal out, uh, so goes Kuzma. And pretty soon we'll find the fate of what Kristaps Porzingis wants to do as well with his player option. So in a lot of ways, Washington is with many holes and in a lot of ways doesn't necessarily, you know, need this uh, point guard to kind of cement, you know, the roster if they were, you know, obviously to hold you know, Pat with everything they had on paper um, if everybody opted back in. So so now the board's wide open for me. And if I'm Washington um, in general, I'm looking for the best, uh, you know, asset on the board, somebody who's got incredible upside, somebody I'm really excited about. And that for me is Taylor Hendricks. I feel like this is the kind of guy, you know, uh, you're looking for a guy with, you know, the ability to make shots, who's athletic, who's got good defense, I mean, this guy checks all the boxes. You know, he kind of reminds me of a Chris Bosh type. I mean, I don't know, you know, obviously if he's of that same uh, ilk uh, when we're talking about Chris Bosh, but, you know, if I'm looking to really like, you know, find a new cornerstone or somebody who can, you know, can kind of, you know, fill up the box, you know, box score every night, 2010s, and, you know, I could have a lot of confidence in him just, you know, kind of running around and learning the game on the fly. I'd rather take the upside pick there and see what happens to it. You know, I think there's, 
some other interesting guys on the board. I mean, I think we're looking at one of them at the top there um, who, who might've also been a good pick for Washington, but I feel like he's more of like the, you round out your starting five with that kind of selection versus, you know, starting a, uh, starting a franchise from scratch, which is where, you know, Washington girl and he sits. Yeah. I mean, I really love uh, Taylor Hendricks. I, I think he definitely has, he, he has a ton of upside uh, in the top 10, you know, outside of, I guess that, that top three there. Right. Um, he, in my opinion, I think he can definitely have uh, be one of those more, you know, highly impactful players. Um, I guess, you know, in terms of where he maybe lacks is like his playmaking ability. Like, I mean, he is, a, uh, I guess, a power forward six, nine, but he's very much more from the three point perspective, much more of a catch and shoot type of, you know, forward there. Um, so, but at the same time, like if he can develop a little bit of playmaking uh, and, you know, uh, just showcase his sheer athleticism and his defensive prowess still, uh, and shot making, I think, you know, the sky's the limit for this guy. So um, he can be like Kuzma uh, to the nth degree, I feel like, and, you know, just be younger, obviously, too, and, and a lot more athletic. So um, that's, I think that's a solid pick. I think, you know, I, I might have taken Anthony Black, but at the same time, uh, you're the GM <laughs> for that pick. So, yeah. And speaking of Anthony Black now, you know, with the chips falling what they may, like I feel like if I am the uh, the current team here, the uh, Utah Jazz, if Anthony Black you know falls here, I feel like you got to take him. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick Anthony Black. I think even with their current team, you know I, I know Jordan Clarkson has that player option. So does like Taylor, Taylor uh, Horton Tucker. So you know for me it's like no question take Anthony Black. I think he kind of fits. Uh, you know, that combo guard model. Um, and with that team, you know, he can play off ball. He can be the playmaker, really good on the pick and roll too. So that fares really well with, you know, the the team with Lori Markinen. They're, they're all-stars. So why not with, the again, the, how everything's rolled out? You got to take Anthony Black here if, you, if you're the Utah Jazz. Now, my only pushback on that is they do have Cal- Colin Sexton there as well. So in any scenario, I mean, how do you see that shaping out? Do you see both of those guys playing on the floor together? Does one usurp the other? Is there a trade? Yeah, I think he, he can definitely play. He is six seven. He is, you know, big and everything. So I think with even Colin Sexton and, uh, you know, even also with if, uh, um, you know, some of their other, like Jordan Clarkson even uh, comes back, right? I still think he can fit in there. Uh, again, he is six seven, pretty big. Uh, and you know, can handle the ball, can shoot, or is working on a shot for sure. Uh, it has room to grow there, but I definitely see that he can play, you know, one through three at least, maybe a four if there are other teams like a smaller lineup. So, um, no, 100%. Like, I definitely think he can play right alongside Colin Sexton. I think they complement each other pretty well, too. So, gotcha. No, I think those are fair points. And, uh, you know, obviously you can have a rotation of guys. Maybe Colin Sexton's more of your, you know, spot up shooter. Anthony Black mm-hmm. can find him on some sort of kicks and things like that. But yeah, switchability is also, you know, pretty important to just kind of note here. So, uh, no, I think that's a, a solid player, obviously, and a good pick. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think these days it's like, you know, bringing up the ball uh, and the way that the NBA offense flows these days, it's like, it's no big deal anymore. You know, uh, even Ben Simmons was bringing up the ball, you know, in his early career. So I feel like, yeah, bring up the ball, just getting it to either a playmaker, whether it be a wing center, like Jokic. Right. Uh, I think that's really what it, what, you know, what it boils down to. So, um, but yeah, I think, uh, Sexton and, uh, black, I think that there's room for both of them, uh, on that team there. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess with this next gotcha. pick here, yeah, moving on to the Mavericks. Uh, who do you got them taking? Yeah, so at this pick, I mean, Dallas is looking for, you know, players with upside, ball handling ability. They're looking for athletes. Um, we might have covered this one as well about a week ago, but I'm looking at, you know, Luka Doncic, um, Kyrie Irving, whether or not he comes back is still to be kind of debated. This team overall needs a lot of help, um, and they're not probably going to get it with one, you know, draft pick here, but... Uh, Jalen Hood Shavino is is my pick here. I think that he checks all those boxes. 
in terms of, you know, what they're looking for, a guy who can handle, who can shoot. Um, he's got a good athletic frame is, you know, obviously still very young. Um, in a lot of ways, I mean, this is the right pick on paper, I think for Dallas in terms of, uh, just taking the best available, whether or not it fits their timeline is another big question. I, I, I think the thing I struggle with most is kind of looking at what happens after, at least in my opinion, like the first seven or eight picks, there is like a big cliff, I think for, for teams lower down in the, in the draft board to kind of make a a two for one swap or, you know, trade a regular um, starter for this draft pick. Like, I don't know, maybe there are some like middling playoff teams. I don't know, maybe the Chicago bulls who would be willing to like part with uh, a DeRozan or something of that sort to Dallas to get, you know, some draft capital out of them. But I mean, we'd probably require a lot more for a guy like DeMar. So it's just like, I don't know. I think Dallas is in a tough spot. I think they're in one of the tougher spots in the NBA in terms of, uh, you know, having a guy like Doncic and really just having no real roster around him. It, it just makes you pretty desperate. And I could see this pick getting traded, you know, in some sense, but I just don't know. I don't know where the fit is, but you know, if they do make this pick, I think Jalen Hood Shavino is a, is a good one to go after. Yeah, I mean, I I I, like, I really like his uh, his play style. I think there's he's definitely like one of the most uh, you know the, the scouts are definitely mixed on him in terms of you know I, I guess his upside what he brings to the table. Um, you know, he definitely fits that I guess combo guard uh, prototype. You know, he, I think coming out of college, like a lot of people do compare him to like Deron Williams. Like I feel like. Yeah, he definitely has that um, uh, that 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 profile there. So I really like his play style. I I think he fits in pretty well again with how the draft board has fallen, uh, fitting in here with the Mavericks uh, is a playmaker. And I think you know the the Mavericks definitely need that playmaker, uh, but he can also spot up shoot as well. And I think that's the key thing there, uh, especially if there is you know uh, Kyrie and and Doncic on the on the same court there. So. Um, I think this is a, a, a good pick. Um, I guess the other ones, you know, I, I might be thinking of maybe they do take something like a lively, you know, if they want to, you know, firm up the, the front court a little bit. But um, yeah, I think Hood uh, Scafino here over here is a solid pick overall. So I'll go ahead and take him. And then I guess moving on to Orlando's next pick, you know, I know uh, again, how the draft board fell, uh, you know, selecting Amon Thompson there. Uh, we did mention that they need shooting, and hey, look, look at who's uh, over here. Uh, you know, we got Grady Dick, and we also got Jordan Hawkins. So this is definitely an interesting, I guess, conundrum. Like having the two of the best shooters here. You know, maybe trying to, I guess, figure out which player maybe fits the team, and you know, kind of what they're looking for. So, um, you know, between these two players, like I honestly, I probably pick. In my opinion, if, if these two players and I'm looking for shooting and if I'm the Orlando Magic, I'd probably honestly pick uh, Jordan Hawkins here. So I'm going to go ahead, take him uh, a little bit a little bit more athleticism. Uh, maybe not as, I guess, scrappy, <laughs> but definitely I, I, I really like Jordan Hawkins. I think he's been you know slighted, slighted, uh, slighted upon a little bit, um, did win that championship and everything, but, you know, uh, plays, you know, smart basketball, can shoot the three. Uh, and you know, plays solid defense overall. So you know, I definitely would select Jordan Hawkins here. Uh, if you know, between Dick and Hawkins, for me, I, I'm going to pick Hawkins, uh, especially uh, if I am throwing a Magic here. So cool. Yeah, I, I don't. All right. I, I can't. I don't think you can go wrong here in terms of uh, you know, taking a shooter and, and having those two to select from. Um, with the next pick with the OKC Thunder, I mean, Hawkins was on the board for me. And, you know, prior to Hawkins being, you know, chosen there, I have Grady Dick. So it's like, I think you can flip flop those. I think these teams have similar needs. I think with, you know, SGA, Giddy doing a lot of the playmaking, you know, uh, Chet doing maybe some of the playmaking as well as, as, as you know, as well as, uh, you know, the scoring down low, you know, popping out and taking some shots, uh, you know, Grady Dick will help them space the floor even further. So, you know, give me Grady Dick um, to go along with that whole squad, along with Jalen, uh, you know, Williams as well. This is a really exciting team. Um, it's time for them to stop, you know, going after these, uh, 
you know, lab laboratory made, you know, players out in Europe and just start to like create a team that is ready to win uh, now, because I think that's where they're at. They're ready to win now. And um, this will be another player um, that'll be a part of their, their nucleus, their rotations. I think that Grady Dick's a very safe player, which I think is helpful if you're a team that's on the rise and you're, you know, pretty much set at all your other positions to add a guy like him to the mix. I mean, he's going to hit shots. And I think, you know, some of his uh, defensive shortcomings, his athletic shortcomings, I mean, those can be kind of hidden when you've got a pretty athletic roster like they do. And, you know, team is probably going to play pretty fast. So um, I'm excited to see, you know, how he does um, in the NBA overall. But I think with OKC, um, you know, he'll do pretty well there. Yeah, no, I, I think he fits in there uh, for kind of what they're what they need. And like you mentioned, they have all these high upside people. Yeah, they need to surround themselves with some just solid fundamental type of players who can shoot, play good D, and that's really all you need. So, and I think Grady Dick uh, fits that uh, mode there. So, uh, I guess then moving on to the Raptors here, um, you know, I think Fred Van Fred Van Vliet, like he his days are numbered. I think in Toronto, it sounds like so. I think they go guard here. Um, you know, I see Nick Smith Jr., uh, Kaysen Wallace, uh, Kobe Bufkin, who's been rising up the boards too. But, you know, amongst these players, if I am the Raptors, uh, I really like Kaysen Wallace. I uh, Coming out of Kentucky, Kentucky has produced some really talented uh, NBA-ready guards, right? You know, uh, Maxi Fox, just to name a couple there. Obviously, you know, Wall. But the list goes on in terms of Kentucky ready players. And I think Kaysen Wallace kind of fits that uh that model there. You know, tough uh point guard, really defensive oriented and minded, uh, but solid shot. You know, has a lot of comparisons to Drew Holiday's game. So I think he fits like a glove over there with the Raptors and what they're trying to do with all that length. Uh can definitely be, I think, a playmaker for them and and that team over there. So yeah, I got Kaysen Wallace going to the Raptors here. Yeah, I mean, I really like him as a player. He's got that dog mentality. Um, be a good, you know, starting point guard in time, backup point guard for any team that, you know, wanted some punch off the bench. I feel like he'll, you know, be good in either one of those kind of roles to start off his career. But, um, you know, definitely has a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of juice and a lot of upside to bring to any team that grabs him. So um, I think that's a good fit, especially a team like Toronto that, you know, we think will be in the playoffs. We'll hopefully get their, the, you know, their team back on the right track after a, underwhelming season last year maybe some trades are in the mix like you're saying um i know van fleet's kind of a a name that's been tossed around as well as ananobi and you know siakam in a lot of ways so like we'll see where that all goes but uh no, i think that's a solid pick um at 14 now we got portland and i think for portland you know they're looking for a guy who can play some good defense um who's also a dog in his own right and who can kind of step right in and be a starter I think with, you know, the amount of reps and just the uh, notoriety this player has been getting over in France as, uh, you know, Victor Wembanyama's teammate. I like Bilal Koulibaly uh, going here to Portland. I think overall he's a great athlete, you know, really good hops. He has a lot of upside to bring. He brings a lot of, you know, toughness and defense. Um, you know, Shaden Sharp last year, you know, came right in. And, you know, for a younger player, I think he was about 20 years old at the end of the year. You know, it was, was good coming off the ball, you know, hitting shots, you know, fitting into the offensive system in a lot of ways. Yeah, you know, they've obviously got Damian Lillard there. Um, if they can re-sign Jeremy Grant, I think that's like a good three-headed monster in terms of scoring goes. So just to have a guy who can kind of be your like do-it-all um, garbage man, you know, whether it's, you know, doing putbacks, grabbing rebounds, you know, moving the, in transition with those guys, uh, you know, learning the NBA game on the fly. I just think he brings a lot of, you know, athleticism and intangibles that most teams want, especially, you know, teams that want to play for the playoffs. And I feel like that's all we've been hearing out of Portland. They're not ready to like hit the restart button. So they want somebody who can like come in and give them NBA reps. And, uh, you know, I think Bilal Koulibaly can be that guy, um, you know, whether or not Portland ultimately holds on to this pick or it's packaged to move, you know, anywhere really, to be honest with you, whether it's, you know, in that trade to New Orleans or maybe it's to, Toronto or elsewhere, we're just kind of all, you know, waiting and watching. But if it does, you know, happen to move them down the draft board, I think that would be, you know, a fair pick. Yeah, I mean, this guy's been moving up 
uh, the draft boards, like on all the mock drafts, uh, I keep on hearing him, like maybe even cracking the top 10, right. A bunch of times. So, uh, just, I think out of any player, right. He has potentially like the highest upside. It's like, is he Giannis? Is he maybe a Kawhi? Is he, you know, whomever. Right. So, you know, he's six, seven, right. And then like seven, three wingspan, uh, you know, pretty decent looking stroke uh, you know, for that, I guess, uh, you know, with all that length there. So, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, why not if you're the poor and trailblazers, like who knows what's going to happen next year, right? With Lillard, uh, is he just going to keep this thing going on? Uh, I know he averaged, I think a career high in terms of points. Right. But, you know, obviously it's kind of like, you know, do you want to stay here? Do you not want to stay here? Do you want to rebuild? I don't know. So I feel like why not take a swing right, you know, right now, yeah. Yeah, we get Zion, but hey, maybe there's another, there's an emerging player that we can get here in this draft and why not pull off he's there. So I, like, I really like that pick there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, cool. and honestly, like for Portland, um, they've got to kind of play for now and for later because you don't know what's going to happen with Damian Lillard. And it's like he may ask for a trade at the All Star break or he may leave after this. You, know, you got so many things that, uh, you know, are kind of creating this, um, this flux as, you know, uh, an executive staff would kind of look at it and it's like, it's not a good position for the team to be in. Cause you're like, well, we would go to, you know, kind of make a roster around you, Dame, but we also don't know, like, is this the best for our team? And you know, luckily Dame doesn't have a new, no trade clause. So unlike Bradley Beal, I mean, he can move once they find the right move, but, uh, that's such a sensitive, uh, action to take with a guy who's been your franchise face for, you know, however many years it's been now. Yeah, man, that that whole Dame uh, saga, I feel like, you know, uh, it's like, is this all for naught or what? Like, it, it, is it is it all just created drama by the media or something or or what? But it sounds like Dame, at least what he says, right? It sounds like he, he just really wants to stay. Uh, I know he's brought up Miami and such, but, you know, it, uh, I, I'm definitely not going to be surprised if he just stays in Portland, kind of just weighs it out a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, moving on here in this draft, I think, uh, with uh, the Atlanta Hawks, you know, I there's several players on here that I honestly did not expect, I think, to be here. But at the same time, it's like, that's a, that's an interesting just kind of how everything flew. Um, so, I don't know. There's several players I like. You know, I, I, I do like Keontae George. I think I was looking at him potentially. You know, it'd be interesting to see, like, him. Uh you know, Trey Young and then, uh, uh, you know, get some more back court depth there uh, in the bench a little bit too. Um, or, yeah, maybe they, they can shore up a little bit on the, the wing position uh, or, or down under. Who knows exactly what happens with Collins? I think that's always uh, been in play. So, but I'm going to go a little bit wing, um, kind of like a, a shooter as well here. I, I think I've always just liked this player. I think to fit them a little bit. Um, I don't know if they're over wing, but I feel like why not just go for that, uh, especially if John Collins does leave or you move him towards center a little bit more of. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and pick uh, Jet Howard. I, I think he fits what they're looking for uh, in terms of, you know, he's 6'8", so pretty good size there. Maybe not the longest of arms, but he is a shooter. Uh, and with players like you know, DeJounte Murray, with Trey Young, uh, so, you know, players that – who you know your team's going to collapse upon right you need those wings they can shoot you know they do have aj griffin they do have deandre hunter but i feel like you know in this day and age like you definitely need those wings so uh i go with jet howard there i think he fits kind of what they're looking for from a team perspective gotcha yeah no i mean i have i have jet a little bit further down in my ranks i mean just for the fact that like they say he lacks a little bit on the defensive side the iq front but he seems to have a lot of the offensive, um, you know, traits down at this point. I mean, just from, you know, a three point standpoint, he has a good feel for the game. He's a good shot maker. Um, obviously his dad played in the NBA. So like, that's a big, you know, leg up, I think just kind of understanding how the game's played. He'll join AJ Griffin there in Atlanta, which would probably be pretty nice to have like some of these younger kids, like, you know, former NBA kids on the same team and stuff like I feel like they just probably will have a feel for the NBA better than most walking right in. And uh, yeah, you need guys on Atlanta that you know, are ready to play in big playoff games are ready to, you know, kind of step in and, and be contributors and, and maybe he won't be as, uh, you know, skittish in front of the lights as others. So um, no, I think that's a good pick overall. I think they're looking for that wing depth. I had a similar player 
um, as far as a forward goes, kind of filling in, you know, another slot as a maybe a three and D or another wing type guy that they can um, have be a switchable player, um, you know, throughout their mix. But man, Atlanta's got so much talent. If you just look at the paper, it's just like at some point they've really got to put it all together and start, you know, really, really uh, pushing the envelope here in the East. No, hundred percent agree. Yeah. Um, but yeah, moving on to uh, the the Utah Jazz next pick here. Uh, you know, they selected uh, Anthony Black with the ninth pick. But yeah, who do they got here, or who you got them taking with the sixteenth here? Yeah, so I'm kind of going back and forth now. I mean, some different players have come off the board, and I I see one that I'm like now getting more and more excited about. So if I was Utah, and I mean, honestly, they're looking for you know guys who can bring some upside, who are versatile, uh, play really good defense. Uh, Noah Clowney out of Alabama um, has also been moving up boards, um, 6'10 power forward. You know, he is versatile, uh, plays some great defense. He actually has a pretty good corner three shot as well from what they're saying. So it's like you, you look at what they're doing right now with uh, guys like Lowry and Walker Kessler. I mean, Lowry will help stretch the floor. Um, I don't know if it'll be a problem to have another four um, who can do the same thing. Um, and, I just I'm looking down this list right now, and if if you're not going guard, I think he's the best front court player still available who possesses a lot of upside to get you, you know, potentially maybe like a 15 10 type guy. I don't know if he if he has a higher ceiling than that. That'd be that'd be incredible. But a lot of what I'm seeing in the scouting reports just indicate like this guy is moving up boards, and in a lot of ways he's got really good touch, and you know just brings a lot of uh, you know good defensive awareness as well. So you know, Utah is a pretty smart organization in the way they've already gone about kind of filling out their lineup. Like they have a lot of these types of guys on their team. So I think a guy like uh, Clowney would fit in really well there. Yeah, I, I do like uh, Clowney. I, I think he does fit in you know, fairly well and everything. And you know, just having some athletic depth, I think, and, uh, you know, in the front court a little bit there, I, I think that's definitely good for them for you know kind of just how things are unfolding here. So. Um, yeah, so go ahead and take him here. And then, hey, look at here. We got the Lakers, man. Uh, you know, had a decent run at the playoffs. Uh, had a, a kind of up and down season, right? But then, yeah, they got the traded away Westbrook, who just did not fit their entire system. And, you know, got D'Angelo Russell, who did. So um, that definitely uh, was beneficial to them. But, you know, for me, when I'm looking at the Lakers, uh, I've said it before, and I think I took him the last one. If Derek Lively is there, you got to go ahead and take him. I think he fits exactly what they're looking for. Um, you know, gets Anthony Davis out there a little bit more in that four spot uh, and that length, man. You know, this is like one team that like they don't mind having those big guys there. Uh, I, I I think they they really uh, look into that. You know, uh, with LeBron and the kind of that roster, having Lively. Lively, he has some upside. He's been, you know, if you look at his high school highlights. He could shoot like, and he's done that as pre workouts uh, for this draft too. Didn't have the best, uh, you know, college showing at Duke, but uh, has always shown that he can shoot a little bit. So why not take that uh, swing there with the Lakers? Worst case, he's kind of like a rim runner, uh, which he, de- he definitely has shown. Player with length, uh, can block some shots, and then yeah, Anthony Davis, you know, can definitely uh, kind of be a little bit more than four there, which I think he's a little bit more comfortable. So. Yeah, I'm going to take Derek Lively here, you know, with the high upside here. So, Yeah, that sounds like a, a guy who could definitely fit in with a, a really good point guard. You know, somebody like a Doncic, somebody like LeBron James, uh, others who, you know, are going to obviously attack the rim as much as possible, but to just have that lob option or you know, somebody kind of cleaning up on the boards and stuff is also good for a team like that. And yeah, it'd be interesting to see, you know, kind of pulling Anthony Davis out of the five and allow him to be, you know, a little bit more of a, a creator, maybe starting at the top of the key and stuff, or just, you know, creating a little bit more space for, for him that might be, you know, to his advantage at this point. But, uh, no, I think that's a solid pick and obviously a value at uh, number 17. I think Derek Lively in most drafts are, you know, he's kind of climbing into that top 12 and stuff. So, um, that's a really solid pick. Great, um, yeah. what do you got next for, for Miami here? here? Yeah, so this is exciting because, you know, for Miami, a lot of what they've been kind of looking at, it sounds like, is going after a guy like Bradley Beal. So I feel like there's two guys that I would go, you know, looking toward here um, that both kind of give me, you know, Bradley Beal type vibes. And, uh, you know, I probably would have gone with one of them a week ago, but now I'm thinking 
Uh, Kobe Bufkin out of Michigan might be the perfect guy to fit this uh, heat culture in a lot of ways. I mean, they're looking for guys who obviously can shoot, um, guys who are interior scorers as well, um, and they can kind of start right away. And, you know, at 6'4", he's he's more you know prone to attacking the rim. He's a good shot maker. He's not necessarily like a big three-point shooter at this point, but in a lot of ways, I feel like he's just got like the DNA that the Heat look for in players. And, you know, if Gabe Vincent and Max Struess are now out, um, you know, we don't know what Tyler Hero will be for them next year or Duncan Robinson. Like I've been hearing trade rumors left and right with those guys' names in it. So it's like, you know, I think a guy like Buffkin could be a perfect fit, you know, working his way into the two, you know, guard position there. Uh, you know, maybe Jimmy showing him the ropes a little bit, but it sounds like he's got a lot of dog in him and, um, you know, probably wouldn't be afraid to kind of step into a team that's ready to, you know, contend for championships. So yeah, I'll go with Buffkin there. I really like Buffkin and, you know, just, and joining the Miami Heat, like if you see his defensive highlights, like this guy's a dog, like he goes <laughs> after it. So yeah, six four. He's been seeing like uh, doing those chase down blocks. Uh, really solid defender there. So I feel like he would fit perfectly uh, with with this uh, Miami Heat team and that culture over there. And yeah, you know Kyle Lowry's only getting older. Uh, Gabe Vincent, you know who exactly knows what's going to happen there. Uh, so a lot of question marks to think at the point guard position. So I definitely think you know with uh, the how things that kind of got shaken up here. Uh, I know Nick Smith Jr. is on here too, but if it is between Kobe Buff, Buffkin and then Nick Smith Jr. Uh, you know, I think I picked Nick Smith Jr. last time, but the more I see about Kobe, I feel like he definitely fits in again with that defensive prowess. So I think that's a, that's a great pick there too. So, um, and then moving on here to uh, the next pick, uh, you have the Golden State Warriors here. You know, a lot of solid players I think that are uh, you know still on the board here. Uh, there's definitely you know. Uh, Draymond Green, I think he declined his player option. So, you know, I think they will go the front court position. I, you know, there's a bit of this whole thing I think about, like, they got to get rid of Jordan Poole, but that contract, like, it's hard to get rid of, I feel like, right? So I think they're just going to make the most of what they can with Jordan Poole uh, in the back court there. So this is where I think they're going to go front court, you know, kind of uh, supplement what they have with Kaminga. Uh, with Wiggins, you know, the rest of their squad, they're in the front court. So I think they just want a little bit more depth. So I'm going to go ahead and pick, um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and pick actually a player that hasn't been, uh, hasn't gone too much uh, uh, awareness, I think here, but, you know, I think Chris Murray, I think Chris Murray. So he, he kind of, uh, I know he's, he has the twin brother, right? But I think with Chris Murray, like that power forward position, you know, he can shoot a little bit, maybe not as explosive and such, but, you know, uh, I think he can fit that that mode a little bit of what they're looking for. Solid all-around player, right? But then just not really great at anything. So even compared to his brother, who's, you know, his twin. So I think he kind of fits what they're looking for there. So, you know, going to go Chris Murray here. I know it's a little un- unconventional, but hey, you know, this is the... This is the Golden State Warriors. I think they're one now. And yeah, here's a player, junior, a little bit more season there too. So uh, I think they can kind of put him in there and I think he'll fit right in. So yeah, Chris Murray here. Yeah, I actually like this pick because it feels like the type of guy that could fill out a playoff roster or playoff rotation and stuff. And that's one of the qualities they were highlighting in his, you know, his scouting report is more or less like he's not going to shy away from the big moment. He's, you know, ready to play you know, meaningful games in the NBA, you know, is he a little bit older for a prospect? I think he's 20, you know, three, if I have it right. Um, You know, they said off the ball, he's not really like the kind of guy who's going to blow past you or, you know, dazzle you with his handles. But I think, you know, they're saying, you know, solid shot maker can extend to the three point line. So you could stretch the floor a little bit. I think for a team that, you know, has Curry and, you know, obviously Draymond and stuff like They could, you know, they can use another guy who can, you know, spot up as the three, four. I don't know if he can play the five, you know, a small ball five or something like that. But, you know, just to know his brother is Keegan Murray and had an an awesome rookie year. I mean, I feel like, you know, the the Sacramento Kings would love to pair, I think, those brothers together. And they've got a pick um, at 24. So, um, you know, if this is the scenario, it obviously won't fall to them. But, no, I think that's a really smart pick if you're a playoff team like Golden State and you're just trying to, like, you know, get that seventh or eighth man kind of solidified to, to go for another run here. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they're definitely one now. So I feel like you got to pick those more seasoned vets here a little bit. You're, you don't have uh, enough time, I think, just send players to the G League again. So yeah, that's just what I'm going here. So, um, but yeah, who do you have uh, the Houston Ross Rockets uh, selecting with this pick? Yeah. So <clears throat> at number four, you t- you know, I took Cam Whitmore at this point. The one thing I would say, looking at their starting five, is I think they're very skilled. They've got a lot of guys who can score that are, you know, more or less finesse players for each one of those positions. If you really think about it, one through five. So I think this team just needs, you know, some tenacity. They need, you know, we've said it a lot of times, like a dog type mentality, but somebody who's got the ability to play, you know, good defense and really kind of, you know, uh, instill his uh, his DNA onto the team. Um, when I look at what's available, especially like where they might need some support, I think a guy who can play like the three four would be the right pick here. So I went with Olivier Maxens Prosper. Um, he's a six, seven forward out of Marquette, but essentially, um, you know, good athlete. He can score, um, you know, on the interior, which is something that they're looking for. Um, they highlighted the fact that he's, you know, a dog, he goes after it. He's kind of that loose ball guy gets the rebounds thing. They compared him to PJ Tucker in one of the comps I saw. So if you can add PJ Tucker, uh, to a team like this, where, you know, maybe Shen Goon's not the guy who's jumping into the stands to get the loose ball or, you know, Jabari Smith is, you know, a little bit thin, you know, for a, for a power forward and stuff. I don't know if he's like the type to throw elbows around. It's like, you kind of just need somebody to come off the bench and give you meaningful minutes and kind of be that, be that animal uh, of sorts. So, uh, you know, whether or not his talent matches up with the pick here, or, you know, if there are better guys on the board still, that's another you know, thing to consider here, but for what Houston's creating, if they're going to do it organically, this is the guy I would take. Yeah. I mean, Hey, I think that's why not, you know, uh, they already have enough young talent too. I feel like, so yeah, why not get a somebody again, that's a little bit more seasoned there, uh, to, to, you know, kind of take that step forth for, with that team there with, uh, yeah, the new coach that, that they have. So I feel like why not, uh, take some a player like that that can fit right in play play that position and play you know fairly well too so um and then i know now we have the two back-to-back picks here for the brooklyn nets so um you know i i a couple of things i think go around here you know i think they can definitely use another playmaker in the backcourt a little bit um you know maybe some front court help there you know adding some depth i think to the center position um but i think with this pick they go they go a little bit more that playmaker backcourt. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll take the top player here. Here, <laughs> I'll, I'll take Nick Smith. I think I, I feel like he's kind of like a Spencer Dinwiddie. You know, who better to learn from than with you know about Spencer Dinwiddie playing the NBA than like Spencer Dinwiddie, right? So, uh, you know, six five, little lanky there, highly touted coming you know uh, out of high school. So I feel like you know the Brooklyn Nets kind of get a pretty good uh, player here in that. And, you know, somebody that can create their own shot uh, and put some buckets in there. So why not? You know, this team isn't really going to where to uh, to too many places, I think, maybe this coming season. But who knows? And I think a player like Nick Smith can help out there. So. Yeah, no, I think that's a great pick. Um, I actually had him here at 21 as well to the Brooklyn Nets. So I think, you know, obviously with what they're looking for. It's another guy who fits their system pretty well. I mean, they are going to have to replace Dinwiddie at some point, like you said. So um, he's a good guy to kind of be that transition piece and uh, obviously was was higher up on the ranking board for a lot of analysts than, you know, obviously 21. So I I would consider that somewhat of a steal on draft day for the Nets and uh, somebody who definitely comes with his own upside. Um, with their next pick, um, you know, there are some guys – I think are super talented that I would also pick here that are further up on my own draft board, but I'm going to stick with who I have at 22 here and Leonard Miller. Uh, he's a Canadian player. He's six ten. I mean, looking at the fact that the Nets want a guy who can obviously bring ball handling. I think they'll get that with Nick Smith, but just a guy who can also be a great athlete and rebounder. Um, Leonard Miller is that he also is pretty good at ball handling himself. He's also a pretty good shot maker. Um, they're still waiting for him to, you know, develop a consistent three pointer um, on defense. He's not really like the type of guy who's going to come over and help block a shot, you know, for his size. So that's obviously something he could work on as well. I think he could probably learn a lot from a guy like Nick Claxton. So, you know, if he's more of like your finesse four and you've got Claxton kind of cleaning up the boards and stuff like that, 
Um, Cam Johnson's also probably going to be playing in front of him. I just think this is the type of guy, if you're a younger Nets team that you want to like, you know, put some money into, find a guy who can bring some upside, who's a little bit younger. Um, obviously, like this team's not really geared up and ready for, let's say, like a really deep playoff run. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if they, you know, can make a play in tournament or maybe be a very low seed in the East. But, you know, I think with the pieces they're putting together here, the Nets could be, you know, kind of on a fast track to being, you know, a, uh, a successful franchise and get back, you know, consistently into the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they kind of went the other way, right, uh, with kind of how they were building that team there. Uh, you know, they, they had a lot of, I guess, uh, players who went with the the D'Angelo Russell years, right, uh, that were kind of like, uh, this was their second stop. Uh, nobody really, you know, gave them a, too much of a shot there, and then they're just making the most of it. Uh, I think they're kind of going that route now, you know, with Bridges and then Spencer Dinwiddie again, right? So, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's, it'll be interesting, I think, what happens with the Brooklyn Nets and, and kind of the future. And it is nice, I guess, they have some two, you know, late, later first round picks here to kind of build up on that depth there. So um, moving on here with uh, the drafts, uh, you know, I'm looking at the Portland Trailblazers. Uh, you know, uh, I think here, this late in the draft, I think you kind of just look at, yeah, a little bit more depth positions, uh, maybe some players with some high upside. Uh you know, I, I don't know how long they're going to be, you know, on the Drew Eubanks and uh, Nurkic uh, uh, world there. So um, I think, you know, maybe they do want to add some depth or maybe some scoring too, uh, potentially at the wing position as well. So, uh, but I think, you know, with if I am the Portland Trailblazers and I'm trying to draft and see, like, you know, get those kind of high potential players, I think, in this, in this part of the draft, you know, why not uh, go after a player? Uh, at least with some defensive upside here. So I'm going to go with, uh, and I think you drafted him a little bit earlier in a previous draft, uh, Ryan Rupert. I think, you know, why not get a player like that? Again, long. Uh, I think he, this guy could potentially win like defensive player of the year. Uh, you know, a playmaker somewhat uh, can definitely develop his skills a little bit more, but has a lot of potential. Uh, I think he's like six seven, has like a seven three wingspan as well. So has that Kawhi Leonard. Uh, type of frame a little bit just needs to bulk up a little bit more but i think a player like him you know why not take a swing again who knows exactly what's going to happen in the future with lord and the rest of the team so yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna take a swing here with rupert no i like that and i mean to pair him up with Bilal koulibaly as well from france i mean that'd be kind of like a nice way to have two guys come over from you know the international scene and kind of hopefully uh you know break each other in pretty well in portland and, and such so no, I think that's smart. And again, we're building a team with or without Damian Lillard. We have no idea, you know, what's going to happen in the future. So you may as well take the upside, you know, available to you there. And I think that's an absolute steal. We get down to 23 in this draft to to grab Rupert. So no, I think that's pretty yeah. fair. Cool. Yeah. What do you got for the Kings now? Man, so this one gets kind of tough because I think at this point, what I was almost looking for was a guy who can maybe play a little bit of four or five. I was actually targeting Chris Murray um, as far as, you know, who I would take with that pick, but you know, I'm sitting here, I'm Sacramento. Um, we just made the playoffs. We were at the three seed this year. Um, at this point, I don't see anybody on my board that really makes a lot of sense to me. So I'm going to go grab Keontae, uh George. He's just sitting there and he's just been sitting there. And the fact that they've just compared him to Bradley Beal, as far as, uh, you know, the type of upside that he may have. I mean, this guy's, he got a shot. He's a creator. He's got good vision. You know, the upside is, is obviously there for this guy in terms of, uh, you know, being a prolific scorer in the NBA. You know, they say he's a bit streaky, inconsistent, um, doesn't play, you know, stellar defense. So in a lot of ways, I mean, they've got Malik Monk, you know, coming off the bench there. Um, this guy kind of reminds me a little bit of what Malik Monk, um, you know, is today. And, and, you know, if he's got a higher ceiling, he's got another gear to him. Like perhaps he becomes like an every, you know, an everyday starter at the shooting guard position in the NBA. And, uh, you know, De'Aaron Fox, if you can bring a guy like uh, George off the bench and just, you know, have Fox with his lightning speed kind of, you know, creating holes and, you know, looking for guys to spot up and shoot. Like that's another guy I would just love to add to my mix. I've already got Monk, obviously I got Kevin Herter, 
you know, Davion Mitchell hasn't really lived up to his own hype at this point. And I mean, he, they may be finding suitors for him. So you never know. But uh, I do know that, you know, if a guy is that talented and that high up on most uh, analyst draft boards and he's just sitting there for a playoff team, I'm, I'm sure they'd come in and swoop him up. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, here in this lane in the draft, best player available, why not? And then it, you try to figure out how to uh, navigate the rest of your roster there. You can trade, you can you know, do a bunch of other fun stuff like that. So, yeah, why not take a shot at a player? <laughs> I guess we overlooked here a little bit or we we're like, hey, maybe, you know, let's, let's we had other priorities, I think, right, for some of these other picks. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And I if, guess, I had a, yeah. if I had a... Th- no, I was going to say, like, if I have to guess it, I mean... I can't see Keontae George going 24th uh, on Thursday, but uh, we'll just have to see. Like if these if these GMs are as smart as us, though, maybe he will fall down there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe he does become like the next Bradley Beal as like a potential All Star, and then we look like idiots. So you know, hey, that's 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 all fun of this. So yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, moving on, I guess yeah, with the Grizzlies here, uh, you know. A lot of things, a lot of drama happening with the whole John Morant thing. Uh, I was, I think, I guess, contemplating a little bit of the point guard spot, uh, just a little bit, just to see. Um, you know, I saw some players, I think, you know, it, it would have been nice if, uh, I guess, George was here, again, that back backcourt playmaker. Um, but, you know, I guess the things just didn't fold out there. So, but, you know, hey, maybe John Morant, he, he's suspended for 25 games, but he'll be back eventually. We'll see what happens with uh, um, with Jones as well. I, I think he has like one year left. Um, so, uh, but you know, maybe we can they can figure things out afterwards. I, I don't know if they're going to be moving on from John Morant, and I don't think they're going to find his replacement. You know, in the later half of the, the first round here, especially at the board and how it's transpired. So, I'm going to pick you know the best player uh, or maybe a player with a high upside here that I like, uh, Dariq Whitehead. I think he would be a great pick i think for the the memphis grizzlies Just high upside got injured you know his, his freshman year there at duke uh but shot pretty well just again didn't played injured didn't have as many minutes but you know was a top recruit and i, I think a player like him you know you can kind of stash a little bit have him develop maybe in the g league and then you know maybe a year from now see what happens maybe becomes a, a great starter there so yeah, no, I, I think that's a good one. I mean, I feel like, you know, they've they've lauded his IQ um, as well as a younger player. I mean, obviously you said like injuries and in fact, he may be a little bit more raw than most prospects were. Um, it might come to a disadvantage, but I mean, you might have said this too, but being like the top recruit out of high school, like for his class or whatnot, like that's, that, I mean, you, you can't coach that really, you know, like it, it may take some time for him to get over some injuries and get like into the flow of the game a bit, but like, I'm just saying, if you've got that kind of raw ability, a playoff team, you know, is, is, you know, is going to be a good spot for, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's too bad that that organization's kind of turned out to be like so immature and so dysfunctional in a lot of ways. Like, I hope that wouldn't stun his growth in a lot of ways. You know, if they were, I mean, maybe you can learn from a guy like Desmond Bain or, you know, Jaron Jackson or something like some of the more, you know, steady young players that they have to kind of like, you know, coach him and get him get him right in a lot of ways but uh yeah i mean they're gonna need um, some guys to to carry some big minutes uh going into the start of this year if they want to really contend so you know they'll probably lean on Derek uh quite a bit if he's he's their selection there yeah and you know uh no dylan brooks uh i, f- I feel like they're kind of kicking him out there right so uh why not have like a an athletic uh, uh talented type of uh guard wing there right so like why not take a swing at him and yeah with injuries right like so that that's what happens with a lot of these talented players you know lively uh was injured uh but then also you, you got to look back to with michael porter jr uh, and everything that kind of transpired there i think he was like taking like 14th but you know he was the top recruit coming out of uh you know high school and you know i think went to missouri and just like had an injury uh a filled season there uh, at his only season so uh yeah why not take some swings at a good talented player like that especially if you have a you know, pretty decent foundation. You don't have to rely on him to be like the person. So yeah, I think something like this could, uh, could turn out well for the Grizzlies. For sure. Um, 
at 26, um, the Indiana Pacers, um, they're looking for guys who can shoot. They're looking for athletes, they're looking for some defense. Uh, Jarris Walker uh, was the pick there at number seven. So I feel like, you know, with their four spot kind of solidified, they got Miles Turner at the five there. I uh, was looking for guys that could either, you know, potentially be spot starters. Maybe they're just shooting guard, small, you know, small forward depth for them. But, you know, if you're just looking at a guy who can, you know, hit big shots, I mean, Bryce Sensabaugh. Um, is a really good three point shooter, um, shot creator, um, you know, out of Ohio State. And uh, I think in a lot of ways, what they're talking about is just maybe, you know, the fact he's had a couple injuries, his lack of speed, he's not really going to blow past a lot of guys. He still is, you know, somewhat of a liability on defense, too. Um, for what they're kind of looking for, I mean, they got guys like Chris Duarte, um, obviously Matherin as well uh, at those slots. So, in a lot of ways, you know, if you just want to add another guy to the rotation, it seems like Sensabaugh, you know, would, would probably be a decent fit there just in terms of kind of being like that, that catch and shoot type option for them. I think they're going to be, you know, probably losing Buddy Heald uh, this offseason. So in a lot of ways, he kind of helps backfill, um, you know, that slot for, for Heald. I mean, this guy can get buckets, so why not? Uh, and hey, if he can get buckets in this league, uh, then there's a, there's always going to be a place for you, right? So, um, yeah, I think it's a solid pick overall, uh, especially yeah, again this late in the draft. So, uh, you know, why not take a swing at some player like that? I feel like that's what the Indiana Pacers do. They just like, hey, this player played pretty well. Like, found has a lot of good solid fundamentals, right? Maybe not too too explosive, but plays the game the right way, right? So, I think that kind of fits, you know, what they usually look for there. So, um. And then I guess here now with uh, the 27th pick, we have the Charlotte Hornets uh, second first round pick. You know, we had them taking Brandon Miller uh, second pick um, kind of looking at the roster now, you know, uh, could add some depth, more depth in the front core. Uh, Miles Bridges, who knows exactly what's going to be happening in, in his direction. Um, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, maybe they do add in some backcourt depth a little bit there. I think that could always help. Uh, but you know, I see some players up here. I see, you know, uh, athletic center, James Najee. I think why not take him, add some depth up there a little bit more, uh, sure up the front, uh, with the current roster. I feel like that, that makes the most sense here. Uh, and kind of just how the drafts transpired. So, uh, you know, why not take a player like him? Uh, and yeah, kind of move on from there. So. Yeah, I mean, he was on my short list here, kind of rounding out the uh, the first round. So I was looking at him for Indiana. Um, I had him go into uh, Portland as well prior to that at number twenty three. So I think that's you know decent value for him. But you know, seems like a Clint Capella type is what they're comparing him to. So you know, if that's yeah. what you can get out of a guy like that, I mean, why not go for it? And whether it's your starter or backup, I think that's pretty safe. Yeah, get that rim runner. Yeah, with Melo and uh, with Brandon Miller. Yeah, why not? You know, what a fly. For sure. Um, now I'm looking at my board because you kind of you kind of threw me off a little bit, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I think for what Utah needs still, I mean, they're looking for um, obviously guys with uh, the ability to have like a, a second gear, some upside. They're switchable on defense and are also uh, good defenders in their own right. Um, I feel like from where they've been drafting, we got them with Anthony Black and who did they grab at number sixteen, Wayne? Uh, Noah Clowney. Yeah. Noah Clowney. So I think you got your one and four kind of solidified there. So I'm just going to grab um, who I believe is the best available wing um, at this point. I'm going to go with Jaime Jaquez out of UCLA. Um, you know, guy they're saying is like a true hustler, um, plays good defense, grabs rebounds. I mean, I think that, you know, for Utah, you know, he fills a lot of those holes that, you know, you'd probably look for in a, you know, starter to backup type, you know, wing player um, in general. Um, I think they're still wait, you know, waiting on his three point shot to develop a bit. Um, he lacks a little bit of the quickness on ball to cover, you know, NBA type, uh, <laughs> uh, wings at this point. So like there are some flaws to his game. That's the reason why he's probably falling a little bit further down the first round here. But I think, you know, he had some, a pretty solid stat line at UCLA. So he's obviously, you know, played meaningful games in college. And at this point, you know, Utah's not contending for playoff. Um, you know, I would say uh, 
high, high seating at this point, but in the same sense, maybe a guy who can push others in practice and, you know, kind of help fill out the, uh, the rotation there. Yeah. Yeah. You got to have those intangible guys, right? So I feel like, yeah, why not add them to the rotation? Uh, won't be a liability necessarily too much, uh, you know, from, I think everything we've seen, he has a lot of experience. So I think he's a player that you can plug in there, uh, and kind of be that glue guy a little bit there. So, yeah, I think that, that could be a solid pick there for, for them. Um, yeah. And I guess, yeah, moving on to the next pick here for the Pacers, uh, I believe this is their their third first round pick here. So, um, you know, took uh, Jarris Walker and then Bryce uh, Sensaba. So, you know, some primetime players, I think, there. Um, just kind of like looking at the roster, you know, uh, they, they did add that power forward uh, and they, they did add, you know, kind of a score at the wing position. So uh, I, I think they made a lot of good uh, you know, decisions there, I think. Um, but, you know, why not add a little bit more depth there, I think, at the at the power four position, um, you know, can maybe a player that can play both uh, center, you know, small ball center or uh, play the four two uh, spell, uh, whoever's playing, you know, usually at the four there. So whether it's Jarris uh, or Metherin to, you know, some smaller lineups. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and take uh, Gregory Jackson uh, out of South Carolina, uh, your alma mater. So uh, I think I've seen him on a number of, uh, 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 Mock drafts actually going the first round, kind of around here. So I feel like he kind of fits in to kind of what the, you know, in terms of the draft position and how things played out. So, yeah, I think he kind of fits in round, rounding things off there. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I guess for the last pick in the first round, uh, looking at the Clippers, um, a team that, you know, I think everybody's waiting to like kind of put their foot on the gas and and take it from there. Um, in a lot of ways, they're looking for what seems to be really scrappy types. They want athletes. They want guys um, who can handle the ball a little bit, but you know, more or less, looking for guys who can bring some toughness. And uh, I thought Aunt Andre uh, Jackson of UConn could probably be that guy. Six uh, six. He plays you know stellar defense. He's a great athlete. Um, just won a national championship. So like he's seasoned, he's ready to play, I think, meaningful games in the NBA. Um, his game, you know, it, it still requires a little bit of fine tuning with his shot, um, his handles um, and all those. Um, I think other like uh, what we call it, um, just more refined traits that I think most guards need in the NBA today. But, you know, if you just need a guy to come off, give you some good bench minutes, I think he could be that you know type of player. Um, if there are other guys that, you know, we didn't cover that, you know, possess some sort of like earth shattering upside that we just, you know, haven't considered yet. Maybe it's a guy from Serbia, Croatia, you know, Slovenia, elsewhere uh, in the Balkan islands, uh, you know, shout out at us uh, in the comments. But, uh, you know, overall, that's that's pretty much a wrap for our top 30 here um, in this first round mock. Uh, Wayne, do you have any uh, initial takeaways or, or maybe teams you thought did a really great job here in this, uh, in this first round. Yeah. You, you mean, uh, uh, teams that we did a pretty good job of drafting with, uh, <laughs> uh I mean, kind of just like looking around, uh, you know, the picks that I like, I, you know, uh, uh, I was definitely excited about the Kobe Bufkin pick, uh, there at Miami, you know, with that squad that they have adding in that depth. I mean, this, Draft, I think, has a lot of that ex kind of explosive uh, and talented combo guards that I think, you know, kind of Miami needs right now. Uh, they're just getting older there with Kyle Lowry. Uh, Gabe Vincent, you know, I, I, you know, has, I think, limitations in terms of his upside. So you could definitely shoot, but uh, there's some things I think on this defensive side and overall athleticism that, yeah, I think they can upgrade here. So I feel like Kobe Bufkin, great pick there uh, for Miami. Uh, definitely fell in love with my own Derek Lively pick uh, there at the Lakers uh, as well. Um, and then, you know, kind of just looking around here. Uh, also thinking, yeah, Anthony Black there going towards, in my opinion, yeah, going towards U the Utah Jazz. I think he can fit pretty well in there uh, with Colin Sexton and the rest of the team that they have, you know, Laurie Markkinen, uh, et cetera. So I think a player like him is, you know, a nice pick there. And then, you know, Jordan Hawkins, uh, I think, you know, he can fit in pretty well, I would say, with really any NBA team, just kind of given his skill set. So, and I think, 
you know, where they're laying up magic. They have a lot of upside players too. Uh, I feel like adding it, him into that rotation, I think that's a great uh, haul there for them. So, um, yeah, I think Orlando Magic, they're set up really well, I feel like. So, yeah, do you have anybody that or any picks that you're like, wow, this is awesome? And then maybe are there other picks that are like, what the hell were you thinking? Yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, Portland, if you're telling me Portland is trading the number three pick and they're getting Zion Williamson and then, you know, with the other picks that they have available to them in the first round, they round it out with uh, Bilal Koulibaly and Ryan Rupert to come on kind of off the bench in that sense. Or maybe they're filling in one of those, you know, small forward spots, every, you know, every once in a while for that team. I mean, you got Lillard, you'd have uh, Shaden Sharp, you'd hopefully have Jeremy Grant again, Zion Williamson, Nurkic, and those two guys, plus, you know, Simons or however else the team is constructed. Like, we don't know what would be part of a, of a trade. I'd imagine if you're trading the third pick for Zion, you'd probably need to have some salary attached to that. So, you know, maybe a guy like Anthony Simons or others are going over to New Orleans and stuff too. So we don't really know, but, you know, just based on value and everything like that, like, I think those are you know, some really solid guys to get in the later part of the first round there. So I'd be really happy if I was Portland with that entire haul um, overall. Um, I'm trying to see what else looking through the draft. Um, no, I think you covered it. I mean, I like the Utah combination of uh, Anthony Black, Noah Clowney, and then I believe you took James Najee. Is that correct with the last Utah pick? Or maybe That's, not. I think no, it was Jaime G- Jacquez. Yeah, yeah, Jaime. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think even if you're just looking at the top two, whether Jaime is you know good a bench player, somebody who's like you know maybe able to push for a starting job at some point in his career. I mean, I feel like the combination of Black and Noah Clowney, I'm pretty high on now. Like, I think those are two guys that could really you know be impact players in the NBA, and you know with their existing core with marketing with you know, Colin Sexton, they've got obviously uh, Jordan Clarkson too. And I think a lot of people are really high on Walker Kessler as well. I mean, that's a, it's a pretty good foundation there. So like, if that's what your building blocks are and you've got Minnesota's entire draft for the next three, four years, whatever it is like, you've got a lot, you got to be pretty happy with where you're sitting, you know? Yeah, that was a terrible trade. (laughs) That was a terrible trade. (laughs) Uh, You know, I think, yeah, there was definitely a lot of like, what the hell? Uh, I had the spacing and such, and now Carl Anthony Towns saying like he's he's gonna be a player that like I don't know like you know is is gonna be remembered or something like that is gonna be like an impact player changing the game whatever like I don't know that's just a bunch of baloney I feel like so um, but yeah like the Jazz a lot of good things I think that are are to come for them so uh, yeah you know I think this draft you know from what we've seen here I think that turns out pretty well so yeah. I'm trying to think of picks that I don't like as much. Um, yeah, I mean, I I feel like who who does Case and Wallace go with? Or you said Toronto, I think. So I, I'm I'm fine with that. Um, yeah, you know what? I I don't really know if I have a lot of holes to pick in what we put together. To be honest with you, because I think there's some. There's obviously some teams that are in some rough shape, like Dallas really stands out to me as being in some pretty desperate Mm -hmm. shape there. I don't know what they, you know, what they end up doing with that pick overall. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't even know if they package it, like what they can actually get for it. So they're kind of in a tough spot there. So like, I don't know if hood, you know, Shafino is the type of guy to keep Dallas in the playoff picture. If they lose Irving, um, that'd be really tough for them. Um, If you could scroll up to look at the second round too, I'm going to take another, scan over what we have there. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a potential for Max and Prosper to not really end up being like a, let's say, let's say like a, a rotation, a real rotation piece there. Um, I think I'm more or less drafting for fit. I'm drafting for a guy who kind of balances out what they would already have in theory from one to five. I, I love, them getting Cam Whitmore and kind of rounding out a really talented starting five. But, you know, is that, is, is Maxson's prosper just kind of like punching above his weight at number 20 there? Like probably a little bit, like could adding Keontae George, you know, had been a, you know, smarter move just to get more, you know, scoring power off the bench and 
kind of trying to find like a Maxson's prosper and free agency with all the money they have, like perhaps. So, uh, you know, it'd probably be another maybe flaw to point out. Yeah. I'm excited about my Chris Murray pick. I don't know why. I feel like, <laughs> yeah, <with> the, <laughs> yeah, I feel like, yeah, that's good. Yeah. If they select them, I, I did want to see Murray go to the Sacramento Kings, right? With his brother and all that. But, you know, I, I think I was looking at, you know, some previous mock drafts and such, and then also looking at what the Warriors kind of need now with, you know, Draymond kind of moving on, it looks like maybe. So, you know, why not take a Chris Murray, a little bit more of a veteran, you know, college player there and, you know, some player that can fit in kind of fits their, their team mo model right now. So, you know, something like that, it could be fun, but yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of uh, unknowns, but at the same time, I think that's what's exciting. And, uh, you know, I'm excited for uh, the draft that's coming up on, you know, this, this coming Thursday here. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I always look forward to the draft. It's always fun to put my, uh, my first round mock together and then, you know, go up against my, uh, my, my father-in-law in a, uh, a duke it out uh, draft battle that always ends in a loser buying the other one, a bottle of uh, bourbon. So hopefully I can uh, add to my collection yet again and uh, put this one to bed, but uh, I'll only have to go through 11 picks. So that's, that's probably to my advantage. I think at this point. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think this is great. And yeah. So is it you, you, you got 11 picks and then, Whoever uh, gets the most uh, of those 11 picks right uh, kind of wins. Is that how it is? Yeah, we we give fractional points for did you guess the right guy in the right number pick or did you get the right guy with the right team? And then mm -hmm. now we have a new rule where if you were one pick away, you get, an, you get a half point. So it's almost like if you guessed a guy at, you know, to be at three, but he went at two, then you get a half point for that too. So like we tried to like continue to finesse this because, you know, as you know, once, once a, a draft starts to go bust, like it can bust hard, like right away. And then the whole thing's kind of ruined. So we've tried to find ways to like keep it fun and keep, uh, keep our name still, you know, alive on the board. But, uh, no, it's been pretty fun. We always do it for NBA and the, uh, the NFL. So, uh, we'll probably keep it going here. And, uh, no, it's been a really fun uh, tradition to be a part of. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Keep 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 us posted on all that. I feel like you know. Uh, hopefully, there's yeah uh, a nice drink there involved, and uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'll be cheering for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I'm glad for that. <laughs> and uh, no, this is uh no, this is really shaped out to be a fun draft. Um, you know, segment here. I like the board. Um. Go to Fanspo if you're out there, you're a nerd like us and just love like, you know, creating scenarios or, uh, you know, doing mock trades or whatever else. But like, you know, you can you can pretty much activate this tool for free online. So uh, go Fanspo, um, you know, keep us engaged here in the game. Um, Wayne, did you have any final thoughts, whether it be on um, NBA, the draft or, or you know, otherwise? Oh, you know, not, not nothing too much, uh, I guess, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, other final thoughts necessarily. Um, I think in terms of like, you know, maybe final thoughts on, I guess, the NBA right now and, you know, uh, uh, with Draymond too, I, I, you know, I think that's been a kind of like what's on my mind of like, is he going to stay? I know he declined his option, but, you know, maybe he does come back and everything like that. It, it kind of just like is a bittersweet moment, I think. It's like, you know, this this was a Warriors team, right? Let's 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 give her credit this credit's due. Like, you know, they didn't win without Draymond. Like I think we sometimes forget about that. Uh when Draymond was, you know, either suspended or, you know, uh or injured, right? Uh you know, obviously some of the you know, it's Steph Curry and Clay Thompson, you know, when they were hurt for sure this this past couple of years, but you know, when Draymond was not involved there, even when Steph and Clay were playing. Uh, they weren't doing so well. So he really, I think, sets the tone. And yeah, it is kind of like, I don't know, bittersweet, I guess, to see him potentially be, be moving on there, I think is what I'm thinking. And I don't know how, uh, you know, those players and kind of how uh, Steph Curry and Klay Thompson both play off of Draymond, you know, with those screens and such. I think that's the big thing that I don't know how, that, how they're going to continue on from that. I don't know what other player that they could bring in in there to kind of showcase that with their cap salary hell that they're in right so uh but i don't know yeah uh so i'm a little bit uh you know bittersweet there but you know we'll see how 
I guess uh, the, the Golden State Warriors move on uh, into next season. Yeah. I mean, I, I appreciate everything Draymond's done for the Warriors. They definitely don't uh, win as many championships with without him than they do with him. So I feel like he was a key cog in that machine. Um, I'm a little bit worried about what he's going to ask for and what the Warriors are going to cough over, you know, to him in some sort of multi-year, you know, deal here. So, you know, are you just paying for diminishing returns at this point? I mean, we saw, you know, some of the playoff hiccups against the Celtics a couple of years back and, you know, he's only getting older at this point. I mean, I feel like a team like Detroit, you know, which is, you know, obviously his hometown might be in play here. might be an interesting fit for him. It might be an interesting challenge for him at this point, just to like, get himself away from, you know, what he built a brand on. And, you know, obviously he's been with the Warriors his entire career, so that can't be an easy move for him to make. But it would be fun to see him take on more of like a, a leadership role, see how he does kind of, you know, wrangling a new team of his kind, you know, under his like wings in a lot of ways. But um, yeah, Warriors, I don't know. I mean, I still think they have enough with, uh, you know, Curry, Wiggins, Thompson, um, pool and others where, you know, maybe they add, you know, a couple more bench pieces or, you know, maybe one guy who can fill, you know, the starting four slot for Draymond and just kind of see where this next iteration goes. Um, we are kind of winding down on the careers of Curry and Thompson too, sadly. So I don't know, but, um, yeah, I think like you said, with, uh, you know, them approaching, uh, you know, some different heights with luxury tax and things like that. Um, could be hard for them to uh, kind of handcuff themselves to, you know, to Draymond for a few more years and still, you know, be able to fill out a, uh, a finals type roster. Yeah. I mean, the thing was like with Draymond, obviously there's a defensive side, but yeah, his playmaking with those two players, right. I think was uh, the biggest thing there, you know, those players, uh, I mean, obviously Steph Curry, he can create his own shot. Uh, but then clay, like clay oftentimes doesn't, he, you know, uh, I don't know what the the data is, but it always felt like when he's trying to do those uh, uh, mid range runners, right, uh, or like you know, kind of going towards uh, the paint a little bit there and you know, doing those runners, like it doesn't always end well, or it doesn't end well. I feel like at a high clip. So, uh, and but then you know, with Draymond and kind of coming off the screens and everything, like I feel like there was a lot better. Um, he, he really, I, I think, helped Clay Thompson. You know, even in his later years here. So. I don't know. I feel like yeah, there's 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 going to be some changes. I think in terms of how they how the Warriors play overall. So, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they do you know bring in some other type of big men that maybe can pass and some screens, uh, or yeah, maybe they just completely just play small ball and or maybe Kaminga plays a little bit differently. Uh, Conch tries to take that Draymond role a little bit. Uh, I don't know. So, but um, yeah, I think just like looking back now, it's like man, uh, hate him or love him. He made an impact, I think, uh, in the game for the Warriors there. Yeah, no, I mean, Hall of Famer. I mean, maybe Hall of Famer here. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like his uh, his stat line does not suggest Hall of Famer when you actually look at his uh, his season averages over his career, and that's honestly no disrespect to him. Like he's he's a tick below a triple double in all categories, but. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the only other free agents that I think, you know, could be possibly good fits here, like maybe a Kyle Kuzma or maybe um, Harrison Barnes doing some sort of like reunion with the Warriors in a way, playing the four position stuff. Like, obviously, you're not getting, uh, you know, prime Draymond out of either of those two guys. But I think, you know, could they be serviceable um, substitutes in a sense, alternatives, like possibly, I think Kyle Kuzma's probably got you know, more upside of the two. So it might be interesting to see like what they end up doing with that overall. You're not going to get the playmaking that um, Draymond brings, obviously, but uh, you know, maybe that's just putting the ball in Steph's hands more often, Jordan Poole's hands more often, and kind of going to like more of a traditional set uh, with your starting five. Yeah, I think something like that could potentially work. Um, you know, uh, yeah, it, it, like seeing that kind of the big man, right. I feel like with Draymond, you know, uh, or with Jokic, right. Like that kind of how uh, he was able to manufacture uh, points there as the big man, you know, a lot of what I saw there, like, you know, top of the key kind of big man, uh, you know, passing uh, whether it's through the three point line or, you know, in the paint, like a lot of that too, was also like Draymond and doing stuff. So 
I almost underappreciated, uh, I guess, Vimon there in a little bit. But uh, yeah, no, it's interesting how that just kind of has unfolded. So yeah, that's just what I was thinking there. Just like, oh man, Draymond, uh, you know, made an impact for better, for worse, I think, towards the game, but definitely helped the Warriors uh, win championships there. So yeah. But um, yeah, for uh, sure. I guess, yeah, moving on then. Yeah, we'd love to hear. Yeah, do you have any final thoughts for yourself? Yeah, I mean, if we're sticking on NBA, um, Mine's just this whole reaction to the Bradley Beal trade. Um, you know, we've obviously heard every analyst in the sports community break this down uh, to a science, whether it's talking about the second apron and how much money it's going to cost Phoenix over time. But honestly, when that trade dropped, like nothing in my in my uh, gut changed how I felt about that team and the upside that it has. And uh you know, I don't know what they do to fill out a complete roster here. I mean, if I was the GM, I'd thinking about, you know, the struggles they've had with Aiton and just personality conflicts and on the floor conflicts and stuff. Um, he'd probably be the first guy I looked to dish, um, probably try to get back some sort of competent five who's more of like your traditional like rim protector, defender, uh, rebounder, just somebody who's not going to really ask for a lot of looks because with those three just like commanding the rock and they're just such, um, I guess like ball, ball possessors. They need, like they all need their hands on the ball. I don't know if they're going to really coexist in a way that makes a whole lot of sense to me, but, um, you know, we'll just have to see like defensively. I'm a little bit worried about their fit, um, going across the line there. I mean, Devin, Devin Booker is going to be playing more or less like a small forward type position with Bradley Beal being your undersized two in a way, unless, you know, they, they go one through three in, in some senses. So it's like you got guys playing like out of position, both on offense and on defense. Um, you know, in a lot of ways I like think about the heat and I, you know, think about when they, you know, created their big three, their big three was created with all those guys being in their twenties still, you know, at the height of their careers. And, you know, this more or less has more of like a Brooklyn Nets, um, both, both the Garnett Pierce, uh, Deron Williams years and the Durant Irving Harden years where I'm kind of like, it all sounds pretty nice when you look at the names, but when you start thinking about how they're going to play together, the fit, you know, both on offense and defense, how they're going to get guys to, you know, fill out the reserve roles and all that other stuff. Like it just doesn't seem as exciting as like, you know, honestly what the nuggets put forward last year, you know, um, could think of other teams like maybe the Warriors are able to get more out of their younger guys, you know, next year, or, you know, Sacramento can throw a couple more guys into that rotation to make them extra solid. Like there's just some other teams and, you know, obviously all these teams that are much younger and on the, on the rise, like OKC and Houston and such where, yeah, man, I'm just not into this and they've mortgaged their entire future to make this happen. And, you know, Honestly, I'm I'm a little worried about guys who average 50 to 60 games a year. And, you know, they all, besides Booker, pretty much have done that over the last few seasons. So um, it's a little worrisome, to be honest with you. And I, I just didn't get excited about it. Yeah, I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> I just don't like it. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, the the new ownership and everything that, that was brought in, it's like, they just want to win now. They want to. They, they want. They have no patience. They're like, why aren't we winning now? They got rid of Mane. Uh, they traded for Durant. They traded two, you know, nice young wings uh, for Durant. So it's like they're they're go, kind of going all in. But I'm like, why? I, I don't think you necessarily need to. I think the one thing, yeah, was probably with Chris Paul. Like he just had him getting older, uh, not being able to uh, sustain himself into the playoffs and being healthy in the playoffs. Right. I think that was a key contributor there so yeah move on from there but man you're just like mortgaging everything here and you know the roster like i don't know where where's the bench uh depth there's you know none like this entire roster is depleted they're going to be in salary cap hell and everything and yeah you know you look at who won the championship uh just you know uh, this previous season yeah with the the denver nuggets right like they were building through the draft and that's kind of what they did. And they were able to make some trades here and there. And it's like, that's, I feel like where the model is, you know, ought to be really more so of, but yeah, the lack of patience, the just constant movement, you know? Yeah. I don't see this going anywhere. And I do like the analogy, I think from, yeah, that Brooklyn Nets team there with what Harden, Kyrie and Durant's like, 
it's a kind of a similar thing where they traded a bunch of young talent. Uh, the ownership just couldn't wait. And then now they're, you know, they're kind of just rebuilding now. So I, it just has those vibes really. Yeah. Not to mention, I mean, we, we know kind of how Durant played within, you know, his last super team, which all gave us a lot of heartburn, but also like just knowing like Beal has been on record in the past with the wizards is like, you know, taking games off and taking plays off and stuff like that's just not, that's just not the type of mindset I think, you know, uh, a true champion has. And I mean, I, I don't think those things can be like untaught or, you know, once you get vibes of that, like, you know, and like, I think Vince Carter did the most miraculous job, like at the tail end of his career as a veteran kind of being like a reserve player and committing to team and, you know, really kind of changing the persona around him because, you know, through his prime years, like his cousin, you know, Tracy McGrady, like they both were on record as saying like, we take plays off, we take games off and stuff. And it never amounted to, you know, championships for those guys. So like, I don't know when I hear stuff like that, you know, that that's a DNA thing. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just not, you know, even at full strength, I'm kind of like, still the nuggets are so, are so stacked and, you know, injuries aside, like if they just go in healthy again, like they've got, I would even call it like somewhat of a big four in a way. Like it's not, it's not a Chris Bosch, Dwayne Wade, LeBron situation, but like when you have, you know, Michael Porter Jr. and Aaron Gordon firing at all cylinders too, like that adds a different element on the defensive side and, you know, just their size, their spacing, all that good stuff. Like they're just able to kind of like toy with teams on the offensive side and, you know, really switchable type uh, type of units. So um, I don't think Phoenix is ready for that, to be honest with you. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not betting high. I don't know what Vegas is saying, but you know, I if 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 there's a way to, bet, I guess, bet against them in that sense, like I, I, I'm all for that because I I I just don't see they they've given up just so much. You know, they I don't know how they're going to fill up the rest of the roster. You know, just get a bunch of vet minutes basically in there, and I don't know if they're able to like, get any more picks necessarily. Uh, so yeah, they're they're going to be in cap hell, and you know, uh. They're they're the re they're they're like the antithesis I feel like like of what's right with the league so I feel like they're just going in a bad way and that's 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 kind of a shame right like I do actually appreciate Devin Booker's game uh you know he's he's a constant like yeah, he's uh, I think a lot of people compare his game right to Kobe right kind of like the heir apparent at least but he's been deemed from some people so uh, it's kind of a shame that what's transpired uh, over there with him there so uh, but yeah. It's just it's just an ugly thing I feel like for the league. Like it is it feels icky, so I don't know. Yeah, no, and that's pretty much the reason why like a lot of these rules have been created. I think everyone's really tired of super teams and tired of you know how they're constructed and all this and that, but uh we'll see. Maybe they can pull out some crazy veteran you know, veteran minimum contracts. I heard Russell Westbrook, you know, if he doesn't get resigned by the Clippers, might be interested in entertaining a Suns run. I don't know what that does for him, honestly, like another guy who commands the rock as much as those other three do, like probably wouldn't be an awesome thing to do. But again, if they can find, you know, starting level talent for zero ish dollars, like that's, that's a pretty good, uh, you know, step for them to take. But uh, yeah, this isn't joining the Miami heat. Like, like we were talking about though, this is like trying to join the Brooklyn Nets. So depending on like what you want to stomach as a reserve player, like that's also, uh, you know, up to your own, uh, you know, free will. Uh, it'd be interesting to see if if Draymond somehow gets there. That'd be that'd be interesting. But, uh, I don't know if that I don't know if that's gonna happen. But that that, that would be like a, a pretty funny thing if it were to happen. Though. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, we are approaching the draft this Thursday, and free agency will soon follow thereafter. So we'll get a lot of the answers we're looking for. Um, I'm pretty sure Wayne and I will put together some sort of free agency preview. Um, we'd also probably love to do a draft uh, review overall. So, you know, stick with us here in the next couple of weeks or so as we kind of continue to put NBA content together. Um, if you're on YouTube right now, uh, leave us a like, you know, a subscribe. If you're on comment, you know, talk, tell us like what you think of what's going to happen in this first round here. Like, do you have any lottery picks that we haven't discussed here? Um, you know, guys that could jump into the top, you know, 14 or are there guys in your first round that you, you know, think are severely uh, underappreciated at this point by analysts and, and such. And, uh, you know, throw them out there. We love to bat, you know, ideas back and forth with you guys. 
um, join us on Instagram. We have reels and stories that we're always, you know, circulating. And uh, if you're on podcast on Spotify, uh, Google, Apple, elsewhere, uh, leave us a review, subscribe, listen to us and, uh, you know, join us for next time uh, with Wayne. I'm Patrick signing off for the ball and breakfast podcast.